Town Hall is grateful for the opportunity to invite Seattle audiences and beyond into present tense exchanges of issues, ideas, and creativity, even when we don't get to do it in person. Town Hall will continue to produce online content throughout this fall and into the new year, and as circumstances allow to even host live streams from our building. Meanwhile, if like me and everyone I know, if you just can't log enough hours on Zoom or YouTube, know that many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form under the header digital media. But back to tonight's program. The event will likely run 45 or so minutes, followed by a Q&A. Dr. Gardner will take questions from the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. Please keep your questions concise and we'll get to as many as we can. Also know that you can view the event both here on Crowdcast or over on our YouTube page if you want to utilize that pl platform's closed captioning feature. Town Hall's adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include Dr. David Eagleman pondering the question, can we create new senses for humans? I guess at some point someone will, will, will ponder the question, should we create new senses for humans? But at any rate, Gatsura Sunshine with a, a special performance of Rakugo storytelling straight from Tokyo. A panel about the unique wisdom of intersectional identities with a panel, I should say, that were twice of local queer and disabled leaders. And beyond those programs, Mario Livio, Marion Nessel, Michael Eric Dyson, Robert Putnam, and half a dozen events in the 2020 Earshot Jazz Festival offered live from our forum space. For more information about all of the above and plenty more, visit townhallseattle.org. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arno Matulski Science Lecture Series honors the UW genetics and genomics pioneer and is supported by Microsoft, KUOW, the Wincote Foundation Northwest, and the taxpayers of Washington State. But as most of you watching tonight know, Town Hall is at heart a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members watching tonight. We truly wouldn't be here without your support this year more than ever. If you're not a yet a member and you support Town Hall's mission to make ideas and inspiration accessible to the whole community, we hope you will consider joining us. And if you're not ready to commit, you can still make a donation through the button at the bottom of your screen. As you might have guessed, this isn't an easy time for booksellers either. And, I, and since you, we know you will want to spend more time with doc, Dr. Gardner's book, I urge you to buy your copy here now tonight through our local independent partners at Third Place using, again, that conveniently positioned button at the bottom of your screen. All right. Howard Gardner is the John H. and Elizabeth A. Hobbs Research Professor of Cognition and Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, as well as an adjunct professor of psychology at Harvard University and senior director of Harvard Project Zero. He is the recipient of both MacArthur Prize Fellowship and a Guggenheim Fellowship. In fact, in recognition of his contributions to both academic theory and public policy, he has received honorary degrees from 31 colleges and universities. Best known as the originator of the theory of multiple intelligences, critique of the notion that there exists a single human intelligence that can be assessed by standard psychometric instruments, uh, Dr. Gardner is the author of at least 30 books, including Frames of Mind, The Theory of Multiple Intelligences, first published in 1983, and the book in which he presented his theory, which revolutionized the world of education and psychology. 2010, Truth, Beauty, and Goodness Reframed, Educating for the Virtues in, for the Virtues in the Age of Truthiness and Twitter, and The App Generation, How Today's Youth Navigate Identity, Intimacy, and Imagination in a Digital World, written with Katie Davis and published in 2013. These last two books were the occasions of Dr. Gardner's previous visits, visits to Town Hall, Seattle, at least in the flesh. A Synthesizing Mind, a memoir from the creator of multiple intelligences theory, marks the reason for this virtual visit. We are pleased and honored, given all the circumstances of this moment, to welcome Howard Gardner. <clears throat> Thank you, Weir, and good evening, everybody. I'm speaking to you from my home in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, the occasion for the talk is a memoir which was just published uh, uh, two weeks ago called The Synthesizing Mind. And um, in addition to being a memoir, it's also a book in which I talk about how I came up with the ideas about multiple intelligence, and then reflecting on my own mind, understanding what I've done for many years in the books that where Harmon mentioned is synthesizing knowledge and trying to present it in a way that is useful to other people. And so those are going to be the three strands this evening, something about me, something about multiple intelligences, and new ideas about synthesizing mind. And I'll be happy to take questions on those three strands 
or indeed uh, anything else that uh, is on your mind at this very tumultuous time. So I'm going to ask for help in advancing the slides, please. Here's a somewhat more detailed roadmap. First, I will talk about the standard view of intelligence and how it contrasts with the view of multiple intelligences, which I, devi which I devised many years ago. Then I will introduce myself, because I am the synthesizer, and that will be a little bit of um, biographical information. And then synthesizing, which is what I think that I do. And then some suggestions about how to help other people, um, ourselves, but also students, children, and so on, to be able to synthesize better. And then, as I say, in 40 minutes or so, happy to take questions and comments from you. Next slide, please. So uh, this is Alfred Binet. You probably didn't recognize him unless you've heard me speak before. But he's the French psychologist to whom we owe the devising of the intelligence test, which we call the IQ test. Binet was asked to predict which students would have trouble in school in Paris a century or so ago. And he came up with the IQ test and was a very clever instrument. And indeed, if you only have an hour or so available and you want to predict who's going to do well in school, the IQ test is a pretty good one to use. <clears throat> and as long as you stay in school, as some of us um, have, you would probably be considered um, intelligent or bright. But most of us leave school at one time or another, and we interact with other people in the wider community. We become involved in all kinds of activities. And the further you get away from the classroom, the less useful the IQ test is. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Reminder of the kinds of items that you see in an IQ test. You might be asked to com complete an analogy, um, the relationship between reinforce and stronger, for example. Or next slide, a um, mathematical issue, trying to figure out um, how long it takes to go around a block of a certain uh, size and going about a certain number of times. And if you like these questions and you do good at them, you do well in them, you'll do pretty well in IQ tests and probably in SATs, college admissions tests, which are basically IQ tests. Next slide, please. The idea behind um, single intelligence is that you can measure people and come up with a single number. So you can get on a scale and you see how much you weigh. You can go to a ruler and see how tall you are. Or you can give an IQ test and you can figure out how smart you are. But as the slide indicates, that's not the end of the story as far as I'm concerned. Next, please. The traditional Western view of intelligence is as follows. There's a single intelligence, which we psychologists sometimes call G for general intelligence. It's highly heritable. That means that we know how smart your grandparents are, what kind of IQ they had. We can predict how smart you'll be. And therefore, because it's highly heritable, it's basically genetic, there isn't much you can do about your G, your general intelligence. And we psychologists, if we be become measurement people, can give you a paper and pencil test, or look at brain waves, or maybe even look at your genes one day and uh, um, figure out how smart you are. But notice I call this a Western view, because if you go to Asia, East Asia, China, Japan, uh, Korea, uh, Singapore, um, you'll find that there's much more effort, much more emphasis being put on effort. Um, it's not who your grandparents were, but how hard you work. And uh, I, I always say you should pick your grandparents wisely and you should work hard. But since there isn't much you can do about your grandparents, the competitive advantage you have has to do with how hard you work. And that's probably a useful bit of advice no matter where you stand on the issue of intelligence or intelligences. Next slide, please. So um, over 40 years ago now, I developed a interdisciplinary view of intelligence or intelligences. Um, please continue. Um, it's based on evidence we have about evolution, um, what we know about the human species as it's evolved over 
hundreds of thousands of years. And it's also based on what we know about brain organization, the different kinds of um, uh, mechanisms and uh, com computational capacities we have in different parts of the brain. I spent a lot of time trying to understand unusual populations, prodigies, autistic individuals, savants, because these individuals have jagged cognitive profile. A prodigy might be very strong in chess or in musical instruments or in drawing, but not necessarily in any area. And of course, autistic individuals or individuals who are on the spectrum have um, quite specific deficits in understanding other people. And it's very difficult to explain prodigies or spectrum individuals based on their cognitive profiles. I also pay a lot of attention to what's been valued in different cultures um, over history and nowadays. Um, if you wanted to apply to college uh, 150 years ago, you'd be asked to translate texts in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Now we would never think to ask that, but we might look and see your coding abilities. What's valued in our own society has changed, and there are parts of um, Southeast Asia where people navigate by looking at the arrangements of stars in the skies and feeling how the boat goes over the water, and that's a very different kind of intellectual um, power than ones in which we look at nowadays. One more. And um, while as most psychologists, uh, and I don't want to be a psychology basher, I am one myself, um, I went well beyond simply testing and also simply be beyond how good our vision was, how good our hearing was. This was a deliberately interdisciplinary study combining biology, psychology, anthropology, history. And in a sense, it was a synthesizing endeavor because I was trying to put all this information together, biological, genetic, evolutionary, historical, anthropological, cultural. Um, I'm going to run out of breath. Uh, but that's what happens when you synthesize. You take lots and lots of information and try to put it together in ways that make sense to you and to other people. And then, because I proceeded in a scholarly way, I set up eight criteria for what is or is not in intelligence. Initially, I figured out that there were seven intelligences, and now think there may be a few more. But the important thing is I didn't wake up and say, hey, there's a cooking intelligence. Hey, there's a sexual intelligence. Hey, there's a financial intelligence. I actually had a set of criteria for what counts as an intelligence. Next slide, please. So we'll take deep breath. Uh, this is how I define intelligence. It's biopsychological. That means it's brain and genetics, but it's also mental and cognitive. It's a potential to process information in certain ways. Um, and in fact, each intelligence is an information processing device or computer. So rather than having a single all-purpose one, which IQ implies, I think it makes much more sense scientifically as well as uh, pragmatically to think of human beings as having a number of relatively separate intelligences. And we use these to solve problems or to make things which are valued. And I think the next slide will have a, um, yes, a um, image of this. Uh, the old fashioned computer, uh, what we might call the general purpose intelligence, you just have one computer and it either works well in everything average in everything or not well in everything, in which case you get no cigar. Uh, the point of view I'm putting forth tonight is that it's still one brain, but there are several different kinds of intelligences, and I'm now going to introduce them to you. Next, please. That's the book. Next, please. The first intelligence is linguistic intelligence. This is a famous Chinese poet, Li Po. But poets, writers, um, and uh, orators, um, good readers, people who read fluently, have a lot of linguistic intelligence. Next slide, logical mathematical. This is a slide of logicians, mathematicians, computer scientists, an intelligence that is highly valued in Seattle. And I mentioned linguistic and logical and mathematical intelligence first because, of course, those are the ones which are particularly 
examined in IQ and SAT tests. And there's nothing wrong with them. I love them, but I'm going to give you several more intelligences. Next, please, is musical intelligence, the intelligences of composers, conductors, performers, people who love music and who can remember it and analyze it. Uh, um, it helps if you can uh, keep time, but musical intelligence means you can go into a piece of music and really figure out how it works. Next slide, please. Spatial intelligence is the capacity to navigate large spaces the way a sailor or airplane pilot would, or more local kinds of spaces like a, a chess player or a go player or a checkers player. That's the spatial intelligence. Um, of course, uh, you probably have a, a device on your in your car, which does the spatial intelligence for you. But if ever breaks down, it's pretty good to activate your the sp spatial intelligence in your in your mind. Next slide is bodily kinesthetic intelligence. That's the ability to use your whole body or parts of your body to solve problems or to make things. Um, so dancers, athletes, craft people, surgeons are all individuals who make use of bodily kinesthetic intelligence. Next slide, please. Interpersonal intelligence. That's the intelligence which enables people to understand other people, um, salespeople, political people, performers have high interpersonal intelligence. Um, and uh, like all the other intelligences, and I'll talk about this later, um, these intelligences can be used uh, in a benign or uh, a positive way, or they can be used in a manipulative way. Salespeople uh, often try to get you to buy something you didn't want to buy. They have to use interpersonal intelligence to do that. Um, next slide is the seventh intelligence, intrapersonal intelligence. It's the capacity to understand yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, how to get yourself to do something if you don't really want to do it, how to occupy yourself during a, a pandemic, and so on. Um, of course, it's very hard to create a test for intrapersonal intelligence because it would have to be different for each person. So I sometimes quip the only people who know whether you have intrapersonal intelligence is your psychiatrist because he or she uh, knows whether you understand yourself or not. And this is an intelligence which probably wasn't very important thousands of years ago, but now when we have to make our own decisions about where to live, whom to live with, what to do, what to do if it doesn't work out, if you don't have a good understanding of yourself, you are in a lot of trouble. Those are the original seven intelligence, but, but I've added another one more recently. Next slide. I call it the naturalist intelligence, and it's the capacity to make distinctions in the world of nature between one plant and another, one animal and another, one rock or cloud configuration and another. And you might say, well, do we need that anymore? We're not living out in the country or in the ocean. But in fact, I think we make use of the naturalist intelligence every time we go to a store and decide which shoes to buy or which sweater to buy or which um, celery to buy. And of course, even if you do it on um, Amazon or some other uh, search engine, you have to make use of the ability to discriminate between one member of a species and another. So those are the the eight intelligences, the multiple intelligences, and I claim in a sentence gives you gives you a much better idea of the range of human cognition, the ways in which people can be good and get better or have problems and need to be helped, and this is the in essence the the idea behind um, multiple intelligence theory. Next, please. So I did come up with this theory, and uh, part of the synthesizing mind is to talk about um, my childhood and my growth and how I came up with the idea and uh, w what's happened in the world because it's, it made me very well known, as we're said in the education and psychological world, and then what I've done with it because I haven't spent 40 years promoting multiple intelligences, but I've become very interested in how we use our intelligences, how we carry out good work. So that's the, the the biographical memoir aspect of the book, but I thought I would show you some images. Next, please. This is where I was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I'm 77 years of age, 
And most of you, if you think about it, can think of somebody who's very much in the news now, who was also born in Scranton 77 years ago. And of course, that's uh, Joe Biden. We uh, did not uh, um, grow up together. Um, he lived in one part of the town. I did it in another, and he left uh, before I did. But uh, uh, here we are. Uh, I'll tell you one anecdote from the book. When I grew up in Scranton, when we used to go to movies, um, they would make jokes about Scranton. And I thought, well, in every city, they would just dub the name of that city. But then when I, when I went, off to, went off to college and uh, went to see movies, I saw they still had jokes about Scranton. And uh, that was sobering. And uh, I'm sure Joe, whom I don't know personally, uh, is aware of the same thing. Um, this is not a paid political announcement. But if you want to ask me later about his and Donald Trump's intelligences, I'll, I'll throw out some speculation. Um, next slide, please. So this is uh, myself and my sister, Marion, um, growing up in Scranton. Uh, we were both kids then. Um, Marion lives in, in Boston now uh, with me, and we were quite close uh, um, decades later. Next slide shows I had interest in politics from an early age. This is me as a preteen going to hear a rally because at that time, Scranton was a completely democratic uh, city, and that's Adlai Stevenson, who ran for president, uh, lost twice to Dwight Eisenhower in the 50s. Uh, um, but I, uh, this, is, uh, this is me as a kid photographer uh, and being depicted in the, in the city newspaper. Next slide. Um, uh, I was confirmed as a, a, a young Jewish lad, and that's my my parents and my sister um, in the late 1950s. Uh, next slide. We'll skip to middle age. Um, this is uh, me. Um, I'm a serious amateur pianist, and I play the piano every day. But I also take out the accordion every day. And sorry, to took out accordion at the time very frequently. And today, actually, my a 10-month-old grandson was up from New York visiting, and uh, he played the accordion and, and destroyed one of the keys. But uh, if your keys are going to be destroyed, it's good to have it done by your, your grandson. Uh, August is his name. Um, so that's me in middle age. And the next slide uh, is me, more or less like I look now. This was taken last year, and this is my family. August hadn't been born yet, but that's uh, my 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 four kids uh, and my wife, Ellen, to my left, though it looks to you like it's to my right. Um, and that's, so those, those are some pictures. And the book has correspondence with Groucho Marx uh, and with Edmund Wilson and uh, Noam Chomsky and lots of other interesting people whose paths have crossed mine. Okay, thanks, and you can go on, please. So I created this theory with a lot of help from colleagues. Um, and I want to just say very briefly a couple of the claims and implications of the theory. Um, next, please. Um, the theory has two scientific claims. The first one is, you can show that, that all of us have these intelligences. Um, birds may have more musical intelligence, rats may have more spatial intelligence, but we're the species that has these seven or eight or nine different intelligences. That's what makes us human. And all of us have these intelligence that's built into our genome. Next slide. Next, sorry, next part. But no two people, not even identical twins, have exactly the same profile of intelligences. Why? We may have the same genes as our um, identical twin, but we have different experiences and we may want to distinguish ourselves from one another. So if one person goes to uh, you know, University of Washington, the next person may want to go to the University of Oregon or to Berkeley or some other college. Um, and uh, we now know that when you take a task like reading, um, you can have identical twins who will use different brain centers to do that. So nobody is exactly the same profile of intelligence as, as anybody else. Those are the scientific claims. Next slide gives you the educational claims. First claim is that we are different from one another. And therefore, 
as much as possible, we should try to individualize teaching and learning. Um, in the olden days, the only people who could have really individual education were the very wealthy because they could hire a tutor or send the child to a school which had a very low teacher to student ratio. But nowadays, especially with uh, smart machines and with Khan Academy and all sorts of virtual realities and other kinds of um, platforms that are available, it's really possible to individualize education tremendously, which means that the more you know about your own intellectual profile, the more you know how you learn, the better it is for you to try to find human or computational um, mechanisms which appeal to the kind of intelligence that you have uh, in abundance, or if you want to try to su supplement or enrich the intelligences in which you are not good. I happen to be very non-visual spatial, but I've spent a lot of my life studying the arts. Um, it's compensatory and it's harder for me than if I was very strong in visual spatial, but knowing your own intelligences can be very helpful and knowing those of your children or your students as well. The other educational claim is that whenever possible, we should pluralize. Um, pluralize means whenever we're teaching anything, we should decide what's really important. What are the sine qua knowns, the essentials in that particular topic or discipline? And then we should teach it in as many ways as are appropriate. I'm not going to say that everything should be taught in eight different ways. That would be foolish. But I've never learned of anything that could only be taught in one way. And so in, in a couple of my books, I've taken topics like the theory of evolution or um, musical opera or historical events and show how they've been, how they can be approached using linguistic and logical and spatial and artistic and personal ways. And if you teach things in lots of ways, two, wonder, two wonderful things happen. First, you reach more people because some learn better through language, some learn better through pictures, some learn better, better through dramatizing, some learn better through introspection. And also you show what it is to really understand something. Because if you really understand something, you can think about it in more than one way. And this is a kind of a chilling notion for those of us who are teachers, because if you only teach something in one way, and you're asked to teach it in another way, and you can't do it, then the thought might dawn on you that maybe you don't understand it very well because it means you can't teach it to people who don't think the way that you do. So, as many of you in the audience will know, there have been hundreds, if not thousands, attempts to teach via multiple intelligences in countries all over the world. In fact, we have a whole book in which 42 scholars from 15 countries and five continents talk about how they use multiple intelligences for teaching, and that's great, but I think I've really been able to narrow this down to two important things. Number one, know as much about the learner as possible. Number two, teach in a number of different ways. And those I think are the most important educational claims of MI theory. Good. Next slide, please. So until now, I've talked about um, my findings as a psychologist, uh, wide-ranging psychologist, but I've also worn the hat of a policy advisor. And as a policy advisor, I've talked about five kinds of minds, which I think we should be cultivating in the 20th and 21st century. And just because five is fewer than eight or nine intelligences, it doesn't mean I've lopped off several intelligences. It means I'm not talking about um, the brain as computer or computers anymore, but I'm talking about as a society, what kinds of um, minds should we cultivate? And the next slide should show you the, um, the five minds. They're called the discipline mind, the synthesizing mind, which I'm gonna focus on this evening, the creating mind, the respectful mind, and the ethical mind. And I've written books about several of these, including this um, overall, um, summary book called Five Minds for the Future. Um, next slide, please. So I divide these five minds into two categories. 
The bottom category has to do with how we relate to other people. Um, are we respectful or not? And do we behave ethically or not? And most of my work over the last 25 years has been focused on that, but that's not something I can talk about this evening, except if you raise questions. There are three kinds of minds that are cognitive. They involve thinking and problem solving, and not necessarily with other people. One is the disciplined mind, where you master particular areas of knowledge. Creating mind is where you deliberately go beyond what's been known and try to discover or create something new. And both of those minds are very important, and um, I've uh, written books about each of them. But what I haven't focused on, on until recently, hence this memoir, is what I call the synthesizing mind. And that's going to be my focus for the rest of the talk. Next slide, please. Mary, Murray Gelman, you may recognize his name. He was a Nobel Prize winner in physics uh, um, over 50 years ago. And Gelman once said in my presence, in the 21st century, the most important mind will be the synthesizing mind. And even though I had already used that phrase um, about 40 years ago, Gelman was the one who really made me think that this kind of mind is really at a premium at the present time. And yet, uh, and this is what the last part of the book is about, we haven't spent much time trying to understand how human people synthesize, how we do it, and we spend almost no time trying to teach other people how to synthesize better. So we might say that's one of my missions in whatever time I have left tonight and <laughs> in my life. Uh, next slide, please. So let me first give you a kind of a, a pictorial view of great synthesizers. Next slide, please. Um, the Bible, of course, written by more than one person, but it is a great synthesis of human knowledge, uh, lore, law, personal, um, compiled uh, in the Abrahamic, uh, Judaic, Christian, Islamic uh, tradition. That's a great synthesis. Next slide. This is uh, uh, Michelangelo and, and a work, a visual work of, of synthesis about how um, you know, God um, created uh, the, wor the earth, life, um, gave it to Adam. Next slide. Um, this was a non-religious effort at synthesis. Aristotle was for two million, two millennia called the philosopher because he put together so many areas of knowledge. And uh, I don't think there's anybody who's been uh, more of a synthesizer than Aristotle. Next slide, please. We have in synthesizing in the sciences. Uh, for many of us, Darwin was the most incredible synthesizer, certainly in the natural sciences. Um, he had some competition in other sciences, but there no synthesizer of the, the power of Charles Darwin. Um, next slide, please. Um, then more contemporary synthesizers who, who will be familiar to some of you. Next slide. Mary Beard, who is a British classicist, uh, has written great synthesizing works about Greek and Roman culture over many hundreds of years. Next slide. Thomas Piketty, an economist. He may have spoken sometime at the Seattle uh, um, tall hall, Town Hall. Um, and uh, he's put together historical and cultural and economic um, material in a series of books which have been uh, international mind openers and bestsellers. Tremendous synthesizer. Next slide. And this one is one who is a member of, of uh, Harvard faculty, Jill Lepore, turns out books as frequently as some people turn out articles. And she is able to bring, bring together knowledge from many fields together, whether she's doing history or current analyses. So these are some contemporary people who I would consider to be very good synthesizers. Next, please. Synthesizer also occurs in different art forms. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in the area of um, classical music, Gustav Mahler tried to combine not only different musical strands, but also his 
whole cosmology, his religious beliefs. Uh, uh, he was a, a Wagnerian who was another uh, composer who was a tremendous synthesizer in language as well as in, in, in music. Next slide. Pablo Picasso, um, uh, this work, uh, Guernica, which was uh, done during the Spanish Civil War to um, help people remember the destruction of a city um, in Spain. Actually, Picasso made over 200 sketches for Guernica. He really wanted to make sure he got it right. And if you know the painting at all, it's a huge painting. It's now in back in Madrid. It was in New York during the uh, Franco regime. But, you know, it has pleasure, pain, animals, nature, uh, love, death, um, war, um, solidity. This is another tremendous synthesis. Next slide, please. And a contemporary artist who I especially admire, Kara Walker, who has done um, incredibly powerful works uh, about American history, um, particularly focusing on, on issues of race, uh, very timely as it happens. Next slide, please. So um, the way I put it, if someone said to me, Howard, what's, what's the synthesizing mind about? I'd say, well, I've spent half a century trying to understand other people's minds, and now I want to understand my own mind. And so that's what I try to do in this book, which is both a, a memoir and, as it were, a manual for syntheses. Next, please. What does the synthesizing mind do? It becomes interested in an issue and tries to make sense of it. And it tries to scour information from wherever it can be found. Um, and this information is typically not digested well. It hasn't been evaluated. And if you want to make sense of it, you have to try to synthesize it. Um, but not all syntheses are good. Or a synthesis may be good for you, but not for other people. And so think of textbooks. Textbooks are a classical example of synthesizing. There's some textbooks which are OK, some which are not good at all. You don't learn anything from them. You already knew it all. And then occasionally, you have syntheses which actually become creative. I use as an example the economics textbook done by Paul Samuelson uh, 50, 60 years ago. This book revolutionized how economics was taught. It went through 12 editions at least. And uh, it changed the way economics textbooks were done forever afterwards. So that's what I would call a very powerful synthesis. But one reason I focus on synthesis is because if you look at psychology, my field, and you say, how much do we know about synthesis and how it occurs? As far as I can see, we know very little. And I think I figured out the reason. In psychology, which is an aspiring science, the way you progress is by writing articles. And in the articles, you talk about experiments you've done or tests you created. And it's important to do those pretty rapidly because um, you want to be able to publish and get promoted. Um, and so uh, you want to have a, a curriculum vitae, a CV, with lots of publication. Synthesis takes a lot of time. I spent at least five years working on frames of mind. And I had a whole staff working with me on it. And that's been true for the other syntheses I've done. And it would take too long. Uh, if you wanted to get a job and keep it, to be able to study that uh, process. Now, I am no Darwin. Darwin spent 30 years uh, between 1830 and 1859 synthesizing before he published On the Origin of Species. And who's got the time to, to study somebody working for 30 years? So that's why in psychology, we just uh, don't understand synthesis very well. Next, please. So you're my student. You're my, um, you've come to me for help. What do you want to synthesize? Are you doing a term paper, a speech, creating a website, a tweet? tweet uh, tweets are, would be super, very superficial syntheses. Tell me, what do you think the final synthesis is going to be like? Do you have any sense at all? Um, well, 
who else has tried to synthesize this? If you're writing about the Civil War, you're not going to be the first person who did it. Um, uh, I've just read a very impressive biography of, of the first years of John Kennedy. When I picked up the book, President Kennedy, I said, well, who needs another book about Kennedy? But the author uh, um, is somebody who spent decades studying all of Kennedy, and he's able to put them together in a new way. Then, because you don't know exactly what's going to be relevant for the synthesis, you need to gather information, but not be too judgmental about it, because you're never quite sure what's going to help with your synthesis and what isn't. And then this dense part is really the heart of the matter, and what we would spend weeks trying to figure out is what techniques, what mechanics help you to the synthesize synthesis. Should you create narratives, taxonomies, equations, maps, metaphors, systems. You can see I'm not, I don't have to go through all these things. You need to create some kind of a language, written or pictorial or codal coding, which allows you to organize this stuff. Because synthesize is all about organizing and reorganizing and trying something out to see if it fits and if it works. I noticed E equals MC squared. That's a quite powerful uh, synthesis. It looks short, but uh, it didn't. It took Einstein quite a while to come up with it. And of course, people have been unpacking it for uh, for a whole century, even more. Uh, next slide, please. Then, um, even though you might want to take a lot of time to do the synthesis, eventually you need to try it out in other people. This is a rough draft. Um, and uh, I always give this to my wife, who's my best critic, but to colleagues and send it out to people who I don't know, hoping that they'll give me uh, good feedback. And of course, the best way to give good feedback is to give them good feedback. Um, I mentioned the, the many sketches that Picasso did as he was getting Guernica uh, into final form. And then um, finally, you've got to give it out to the world, whether it's a an, a, a business plan or a, uh, a, 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 a research grant or a, uh, a magnum opus, uh, in whether it's in the arts or the sciences or in humanities. Um, and then, and this is what I think has happened to me, um, you get to be better at it. If you've been synthesizing as I have for a lifetime, even though I didn't realize I was doing it when I was young, you get better at it and you're more likely to be able to help other people do it well. Uh, next, please. So this is a little bit conceptual. Um, if we think about syntheses, there's a continuum. Um, on the one end, it's just a competent summary. Um, and this is what you do if you're good in a discipline. And the best example of that is a textbook. Um, because a textbook, typically, I mentioned the exception, um, it doesn't try to be um, creative. But at the bottom of this of, the, of this list here, you see a synthesis where you actually are breaking a paradigm, you're creating a new paradigm, and that's a, a creative mind. This is where you do something that is so new and unusual, and you doesn't mean have to be a person, it can be dozens of people, that it actually breaks the paradigm and does something new. Um, uh, all of these are syntheses, think of it as a as a, as a line, but at one end, it's just a competent summary, um, which is maybe a little bit original. The other hand is putting together something the way Picasso or Mahler or Einstein or Darwin did, which is entirely new. And then there's stuff that's in between, um, and some of the people that, uh, you know, textbooks that you've, re you've written or um, artists or musicians whom you like, maybe doing things which are modest syntheses, not absolutely um, ones which uh, demolish all, all previous thought. Um, so we're, we're coming to the end. Next slide, please. Here's a list of some threats to syntheses. Um, and this again is what I would do if I were teaching synthesis. Ones that are too broad. You know, you can't really do a history of the world anymore. Too mired in details. Improperly conceived or executed. Not appropriate too solipsistic, not paying attention to feedback, um, trying to be creative without having done your homework. 
And a synthesis, which is good for you, which is fine if you don't want to use it with anybody else, but if you want to teach from it or reach a staff or reach colleagues, it can't be too solipsistic. Next slide, please. So I want to conclude, and this is, I think, uh, particularly relevant for the Seattle area, which is what's synthesis going to be like in the 21st century? Next slide, please. It could be that artificial intelligence or deep learning or some other kind of computational device um, may be able to do better syntheses than we human beings can. Um, that's a big question. Um, and if that's the case, then I'm out of business. Um, also, I wouldn't be surprised if even today, if uh, uh, a computational device were to um, read all of my books, they could probably do a pretty good spoof of how I synthesize things. But I'm not ready to throw the towel in yet. Uh, next slide. Um, this is a company which I'd never heard of, but it just uh, went public for uh, $22 billion, I think. Um, and so I've done some investigating about it. It's called Palantir. Some of you will have heard it. It, it was in um, Silicon Valley, um, but I think it's moving to Denver. And you can hire Palantir, either government or a business, to put stuff together, all kinds of disparate data, and to organize it in a way in which uh, makes it uh, possible for you to use. And uh, um, Palantir is quite controversial. I'm certainly not going to try to pass judgment on it. But let me simply say, I'm very happy to have Palantir or some other computation device do the synthesizing, but I'm not willing to let them decide what should be synthesized, nor am I willing to let them decide once the answer has come out whether that's the answer that I want to make use of. I think for as long as human beings are around, these should be done by human beings. So fine to use Palantir or some other company to crunch the data, but not to decide what to look at and not to decide what to do at the end of the day, though the advice might be very helpful. Um, next slide, I think, uh, will bring us to the conclusion and time for questions. And I think I may have one more slide just to remind you of the book. Or maybe not. So um, I'm happy to turn this over to Candace and take some questions. Ah, thank you. Great. Um, we've got a couple of good questions here. I'm glad you brought up AI in the last part there. That's kind of what I was thinking of this whole time. Um, and I think if you're out of business because that, I think a lot of us will be. Um, I personally kind of dread it. Um, I'm going to start with some of the questions that are not, there's a lot of questions that are kind of touching on our present circumstances. Um, so I'm going to save those for a little bit later. But um, this first one is from Quina. Um, and she's asking, how does mindfulness or meditation feed or inform interpersonal intelligence? If you practice mindfulness or meditation regularly, does it improve this intelligence or is it something you're born with? Um, one good or bad aspect of me is I don't pretend to answer questions which I don't know the answer to. Um, certainly mindfulness can't be a bad thing, but uh, I don't think it's a guarantee to have um, good understanding of yourself. I mean, if you have a personality disorder, it might push you into uh, even less good understandings of yourself. Um, but uh, I do think that if you, ta if you, if you um, are mindful or you introspect, but then you get some feedback from other people about whether what you've said makes sense or not, then I think it'd be very educational. And no, I don't believe anybody is born with a high degree of intrapersonal and intrapersonal intelligence. That's clearly something we have to develop from scratch. So thank you, Quina. Right. Uh, and then Queen actually has one more that I think is kind of interesting. Um, what is the role of empathy in the five minds of intelligence? When I talk about um, respectful mind and ethical mind, um, you cannot have those kinds of minds unless you have empathy. But 
the empathy is very different for a respectful mind. The empathy there is for individuals who you see regularly, family, friends, um, associates at work. Um, the ethical mind is for the more for more impersonal situations where you are a professional, like a doctor or a lawyer or a journalist, and of course you should be nice to people, but you have to be straight with people, and sometimes that may be telling things that they don't want to hear. So it's a different kind of empathy, and in fact, the first kind of empathy can get away, can can get in the way of the second kind of empathy, because if you're a doctor and you have some hard news to give to people, if you're too, if you're too worried about their feelings, you can't give them the hard news. So we have to be able to balance these more personal relations with ones which are called for by our roles. Similarly, a journalist may want to tell you what you want to hear, but that's not the journalist's job. The journalist's job is to tell you what you need to know. Okay, this next one is from uh, Ahava. Uh, and they're asking, is it possible that existential intelligence, the 8.5 or ninth intelligence, uh, might be relevant in the 21st century and how might it connect with uh, synthesizing mind? Well, that's a great question. It's never, never been asked to me before, but I do have an answer. Um, and that is that I'm not religious myself, but I don't think that our current issues in the world, political, economic climate are going to be able to be dealt with unless we have something which is like a religion. It doesn't need to have a God. You might say that's optional. Um, I do think it needs to have a Moses or a, a Christ as the embodier of it. And I think that is going to be what's going to save our planet or destroy it. Um, and my own writings, people may know, for me, the most important person for the last thousand years was Gandhi, because Gandhi understood that unless we can handle things peacefully, we're going to destroy the world. And I'm afraid that we may discover after November 3rd uh, how important Gandhi is if we can't deal with things in a peaceful way. Um, okay, so I so that's kind of a nice uh, move into sort of uh, some of these current current day present moment questions. Um, this one's from Michael. Uh, he's asking, how would Dr. Gardner suggest using multiple intelligences to reunite America and work toward bipartisan cooperation? Well, I have I have um, two thoughts here. Um, number one, I think we need to respect human beings who are worthy of respect and uh, people can be respected for whatever it is that they do and they should be. I think one valuable lesson from the pandemic is the number of essential workers who are in the front lines who were invisible to many of us and we now realize that we're much more dependent upon them than we are, if I can be a little bit contentious, on people in Wall Street who are making millions of dollars for themselves but are not helping us get food or anything like that. But the what I've spent a great deal of time on, and I alluded to this in, in the talk, is it's not enough to develop intelligences. We have to use them in a pro-social, positive way. Both Nelson Mandela and Slobodan Milosevic had lots of interpersonal intelligences. They knew how to move people. Um, Nelson Mandela brought a warring country closer together. Milosevic engaged in ethnic cleansing. Every intelligence, language, personal, spatial, bodily, can be used in a good way or in, in a bad way. And even though I'm certainly not uh, grandiose enough to think that what I'm going to say to this evening is going to have any effect in the wider world, I think it's only if we come to respect people for how they are and what they can do, rather than how much money and power they have, and if we learn to um, use our intelligences in a pro social way rather than an anti or destructive way, um, this, the planet's not going to survive politically or economically or in terms of climate and, or in terms of health. So this is a very existential moment. Um, so that's why existential intelligence is on some of your minds as well as on my mind. Um, this next one's from Steve. Um, and he's asking, 
how can multiple intelligences be applied to current online schooling during the pandemic? I think that um, if we talk about the two educational um, buzzwords that I introduced, uh, individuation and pluralization, uh, I think that that gives you a way to think about this. Um, we don't all have to learn things in the same way. And the more we know about how individuals learn, the more we can find um, approaches which work for them. We're, my wife and I are past the child age, we have grandchildren, and we're working with uh, four of grandchildren, not with August, who's only uh, 10 months old. And we're trying to find ways that work for each of them. We're not trying to legislate a single way for each of them. And of course, we're lucky to live in an era where, in addition to Zoom, you know, there are dozens and dozens of different platforms which present things in different media. And so if you're trying to understand something, whether it's the civil rights movement or the nature of gravity, or what a fugue is, you're not bound to a, to a dictionary definition. There's just lots of ways to show it. But you know, you need to have the, the tools, you need to have the computers, and then you know how to search to find the things. And if you're like me, you need some help sometimes. Uh, I'm very happy, happy to have Candace help me. Um, and again, the more, the more individualistic and egotistic we are, the less we're going to be able to get through this. But if people really try to help one another, you know, you're in a, in a neighborhood and you say, all right, I'm having, Johnny's having trouble learning his algebra. What can we do? Then you might be able to find some entry points and some um, levers to, to, to nudge him or, sh him or her along. Yeah. Um, this other question from Susan kind of um, is a little more specific. Um, she teaches a language class with 10 students and is wondering, is it possible to identify their intelligences to individualize their te the, her teaching of them? Of them? Um, this is, well, yeah, so this, this has two parts. One, can she um, identify their intelligences? Um, I don't use tests for this sort of thing, um, but you know, I would talk to them about their interests. I would talk to their parents to get to kind of get information from them. If she has time as a small class, uh, you know, spend some time with them online and watch what they what they explore. If we weren't in a pandemic, I say go to a children's museum with children, and you'll see very quickly what interests them and what what they're better at. But also, um, there are many ways to teach a language. Um, even though obviously it involves linguistic intelligence, um, there are musical ways, there are spatial ways, there are bodily ways. And the more you understand language, let's take diagramming sentences. You know, I learned how to diagram sentences visually, but there are many ways to understand how sentences work, and that's a very um, important part of language. Um, initially, I thought that um, you couldn't use the multiple intelligence to teach foreign languages, and I was shown to be completely wrong. There are dozens of articles in many, many different languages showing people using multiple intelligence to teach foreign languages. So that was my own narrow-mindedness. I thought you could only teach languages one way. And you're lucky if you have 10 kids. It's much harder if it's 30. But you know, we live at a time where one-on-one -on -one is much more possible than it was in Aristotle's time or even in my grandparents' time. Sure. Um, I want to ask this next question, uh, and, and depending on how long your answer is, it might be our last. Um, but uh, Donna is saying is asking and saying, yes, please talk about Biden's and Trump's intelligences. <laughs> OK. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, Biden is probably a, a, a fairly standard politician of having good linguistic and good social intelligence. And I think he has got some uh, intra-personal intelligence. Um, uh, I don't think that Trump is either a, a genius or a, a, a numbskull, but I think he has media intelligence. Um, that is, uh, first of all, he was able to create a television program, which uh, The Apprentice, which lasted for a long time. He learned how to deal with big crowds there. And then he realized the power of Twitter. Uh, and he basically has a Twitter presidency. And here I'll draw on my knowledge of leaders. Leaders have always had to be able to control the medium of their time. Moses couldn't talk, so his brother Aaron became a spokesperson. Gandhi 
would not have survived without the telegraph because when he went on a hunger strike that had to be te texted all around the world so people would have protest that he shouldn't be allowed to starve. John Kennedy figured television, Roosevelt radio, Hitler radio, Mussolini radio. So I think uh, Trump's genius, such as it is, is in knowing how to use media. Um, however, probably most of the people who are watching this now uh, are, are not, do not feel that's what we need in a president. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bonus, so to speak. <laughs> uh, it strikes me that um, Obama actually was able to use the internet pretty well um, campaign, campaigning his, uh, uh, during his during his. I, I think that, I, I think that Obama was a brilliant campaigner, mm -hmm. but um, when he became president, he was talking too much to people like me. Um, Bill Clinton was much much better at cutting across the the divides. It was once said he was the first black president, of course, that's a joke, but it meant he could really cut across color, ethnicity, and education. And his wife couldn't, and uh, Obama didn't after he was elected. And of course, Trump says, I love the purely, uh, love the poorly educated, even though he himself brags about how smart he and his family are. He is a conundrum. They'll be writing books about him uh, but let's hope there for a long time, let's hope there's still a, a world in which we want to live uh, going forward. Right. All right. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Gardner. Um, this has been a really interesting talk. Um, thank you for uh, working with us through the tech and I'm so glad that we were able to make it happen. Um, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. Thank you for all your questions. Um, if you're interested in buying a copy of The Synthesizing Mind, um, please click on the link on whichever stream you're watching. Um, that's going to take you right over to Third Place Books, where you can purchase a copy and support our local bookstores. Um, if you also want to support Town Hall, you can donate on the page that you are on, and you can follow the Crowdcast channel um, by clicking the follow button in the top right corner. Um, so, Dr. Gardner, thank you so much again, and hopefully we'll um, be in touch again and see you again sometime when we are able to be in person. Thank you, Candace. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Ware, and good night. Great. Have a good one.